Um, hi. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think I have to adapt a bit to the stage, but um, welcome. Um, first thing I want to kind of put out is that I'm an artist. I'm neither a theorist nor a programmer. I'm kind of in between and I can do some things but might not even understand what I'm doing sometimes. And um, today I want to talk about uh, aesthetically, aesthetical implications and possibilities of the moving image and to a certain extent how machine learning or artificial intelligence shifts these possibilities and um, because I feel a lot of the things I'm doing kind of come from actually doing and showing them. Um, a large chunk of this presentation will kind of revolve about my kind of pre-AI work, but all my work have, um, has something in common. It's kind of um, trying to put the chaos in my head into a certain reality from films and later installations and helping me and maybe others sometimes to make sense of the world of our society from the reflection and the kind of interpretation of the work. So these emotional distillates try to connect to the viewer's memory. And um, yeah, I'm interested in breaking things to a certain extent, but, but I'm always, always interested in not just showing this glitch of a black box, but try to integrate it into my visual or artistic language and constantly refine it. And um, yeah, I'm starting usually with a direct impulse coming from a drawing and trying to embed my personal being in a gesture, in a physicality, in something that is um, capturing the moment. And interestingly, uh, the AI has kind of certain qualities of drawings which are, which might be interesting to explore, but there's always the necessity to have an original or personal idea to start with. So um, the first thing I did being in university uh, centuries ago um, was doing experimental films where I tried to take the properties of painting and drawing and put them into motion, combining them with 3D shapes and animation and um, trying to do or trying to find new ways of expressing something visually. And um, because there's not so much time today, all, or most of my films can be seen online. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of jumping in between uh, different things, but as said, they're always refined from the project before. And after university, I was kind of thinking, um, okay, I'm an experimental filmmaker. That, that's not a normal job, but maybe I find a way to live with it. But I didn't the way I hoped maybe and um, had to kind of try to find ways to go out of the cinema and create hybrid films. And with hybrid films, I mean films that are intended for a different surface to be screened or projected on. And then sometimes if I feel the project is right, I take it back into the short film realm. And it, it took me quite some time sitting in front of the computer trying to figure out a visual universe and then putting it back into something kind of that is control. Um, colliding with reality, but, but there are some interesting kind of combinations that happened. And over time, I found that 
the image can be so fluid, it can start as a projection for a building, it can turn into a film and then in a more classical way turn into kind of the illustration for a record cover. But um, everything is kind of kind of stuck in between these different um, moments. And um, when I started working with projection and architecture, I realized that all my work is abstract. Everything I do is kind of just looking to create an emotion, trying to um, recreate something I experienced there or want to experience there. And um, it's really hard to capture these moments because you're, if you're in the space, um, you, you can kind of immerse into it. And the word immersion is something quite kind of current, but still it, it's a good description of it. But um, nevertheless, I'm, I've been working yeah, for more than 20 years now, trying to find different ways to, to show my work. Here, for example, projecting on sculptures that are kind of laser cut, sculptures made out of uh, different uh, films or moving um, surfaces that kind of shift the image that is quite kind of precisely constructed in, um, yeah, for me, unpredictable ways. And also trying to adapt the language of um, art or art history. I try to explore concepts of overpainting, for example. Um, uh, in this case, uh, Greek or, yeah, Greek. Uh, sculptures or plaster cast of Greek sculptures. I worked on projecting on uh, dinosaur skeletons in Mongolia or kind of um, staging laser drawings in uh, old buildings. And with all of that, there's always kind of this search for something new, for something exciting. I pushed it into other realms of doing work on laser drawings on mountains, projecting on fog, projecting on water, doing all these things that are kind of trying to make the things come out of the screen and kind of flow into different shapes and states. And then um, in recent years, I'm sometimes doing performances, um, projecting on, for example, here, uh, a group of performers uh, using paper to build dynamic sculptures. And I thought, oh, that could be an interesting way of um, going into new territories and finding new ways um, to present my work in combination with the ultimate kind of unpredictability being human performers. But then, um, yeah, Corona happened and nothing happened anymore. And um, this was it not exactly the first time, but, but kind of the most prominent and maybe also the reason why I'm here, a time where AI came into play and interplay with my work. And um, therefore, I want to show one film. And I said the other films are online, but this one as well, but this one I want to show on the screen and then maybe go into more confusing things. So maybe we can switch off the stage light and now you have four minutes 30 of uh, a film. Yeah, hopefully with sound. Is there sound? Oh, is it not
thank you. Um, so this was hysteresis and kind of the um, artistic kind of result or I don't know, explosion or whatever coming from um, in the pandemic and the combination with the advances in machine learning. Um, the, the film, yeah, I think it was only possible thanks to Tsuki, um, a performer I met in Berlin some years ago and um, with an interesting kind of quality maybe to say because she came to an exhibition of mine and spent an hour in the exhibition watching works and usually at least at openings um, yeah the art is usually the backdrop for social interactions but it's not really about the art and, and I found it um, exciting that there was someone I didn't know and that kind of uh, reacted so strongly and with the first lockdown ending um, we thought or I, th I asked Suki if there's a way to, to meet and to project on her record everything and try to make sense of our lives again and um, on a technical note um, for my stuff I was using touch designer kind of creating these feedback loops uh, kind of projecting the drawings or moving drawings and trying to um, be as flexible as possible because usually I work for weeks and months on something and here this, this moment of performing and interacting was very strongly and um, I felt um, that it's something I was forced to learn in a way. And the other thing that most of you might uh, find a bit uh, silly, but, but I'm very thankful for something like uh, Google Colab. Back in the days, it offered kind of access to something that was um, not accessible usually before for artists or not as easily. You had access to um, a decent GPU, you had access to something kind of created by a lot of people in Python and um, I was using VQGAN and Clip at that time um, created by Catherine Crawson and I found it interesting how um, and this was 2021, so it's kind of completely obsolete, but, but I tried to create something that is to a certain extent timeless because it's kind of moving within um, an art historical latent space. So you have Tsuki performing, me projecting the drawings, and then I'm kind of um, trying to move through um, human... The, the history of human artistic achievements from Renaissance painting to charcoal drawings to, I don't know, um, plaster casts. And um, with this kind of knowledge to my hands, I was trying to make sense of the world again and also trying to kind of portray the transformational process Tsuki was going through. So this, this film is, I don't know, um, maybe it doesn't make much sense for most of the time, but it doesn't try to. And it's kind of a testament in the sense, uh, like most of my work, that it's um, functionless because I don't want to tell a story, I don't want to sell you anything, I don't want to communicate a specific idea. I just want to open this, this confusing space and some people might just ignore it and others kind of create connections. And this kind of infinite field of connections is kind of these few bullet points I will go through 
as an anecdotal evidence of my work with AI. It's to a certain extent very dated, but it also is, um, yeah, maybe in in the sense universal that that you have to experience it in these specific cases to really understand what's happening. I mean, it's clear that AI will uh, kind of influence everyone and everything. It will dissolve boundaries. For me, it was kind of the boundary of a specific medium. It was interesting how the creation process becomes more conceptual and it's really hard to break out of a certain kind of culture of templates or presets because it's so overwhelming to have this access that you feel kind of just diving through the given possibilities is enough to fill a lifetime. But um, the other side of it, and now being like two and a half years into uh, this AI revolution is that it seems that no stone is unturned, nothing is not turned into a business model that tries to sell you kind of the user or the data the user created back to the user. And it's still not fully clear to me why, or it's clear to me, but it's surprising to me that um, destroying kind of the jobs of artists, of illustrators, which have been precarious in the first place and which had to survive somehow for centuries and now these uh, big corporations come along and take away these things and just kind of put it out for everyone. And um, of course you can then discuss if it's still art into uh, art that is created by the machines but in the end, um, if there are enough people that think these creations are art, um, the artists don't have a saying anymore. Mm. Um, the other interesting thing I found for myself, and these points are clear to most of you, I'm sure, but I still found it interesting that the quality or the non-quality of the training data and these models is sometimes so absurdly bad. There are kind of image, image compression, compression artifacts, artist signatures, croppings, framings that don't make any sense. And it shows that nobody gives a fuck about the creation of these data sets. And um, I was just kind of trying to to figure out a certain artistic style and time period, and I was just wondering why these images that created with VQ GAN created were that bad until I realized, oh, obviously there were so small resolution images in this data sets for this specific pocket that it wasn't possible to create a kind of working image out of that. And the other thing, which is kind of covered by the bias, of course, is um, that I was born in former Eastern Germany. And there's this talk about that certain continents and countries are underrepresented. And it's also the case for kind of the time I grew up. And it's interesting that this is kind of completely kept out of the data sets. And with kind of the explosion of these tools, these things start to disappear more and more because the AI-generated art is kind of going back into these data sets. And I wonder what, what will remain because, I mean, most people are kind of attracted to this mid-journey, glossy 3D rendering style, but there's so much more and I don't know what will be left. Um, that's something I kind of just mentioned before, that this kind of access to software, to public software is highly interesting. I've been following um, kind of computer graphics papers from SIGGRAPH like 20 years, and it's the first time that something 
goes directly from research into kind of being an accessible tool. But on the same hand, the phenomenon of app culture is kind of kind of going into this process that software will break faster and disappear much faster than ever before. And it's interesting that I created this film like two and a half years ago, and some of the things are not reproducible that easy again because some of the libraries have been updated and nothing works anymore. Um, with this comes also kind of something from the title, but also in, gener in general observation that it's the first time that this uh, attraction I had to drawing, kind of this spontaneous and direct conversation with my hand and my body is now available in tools to create images. And it will be very interesting when there will be more refined UIs to curate and mutate through these different data set spaces. And I wonder for myself and also for everyone else, what will happen if we just become completely overwhelmed by the possibilities and kind of um, the feeling that nothing will ever be finalized. And this feeling is very strong for me because I often suffer from not finishing or not finding something that feels kind of like a result. So, yeah, I really hope that we don't lose kind of the drive after everything has been kind of put into these optimization and kind of variation processes. Um, how much time? Ah, okay. Um, the other thing that is also just a side note, and there are just three more to go. Um, it's interesting how there are now stars. So there's kind of this social media phenomenon that is known from music and fashion is now part of uh, the art world where art influencers or AI art influencers gain access to technology and kind of create a hype cycle. And that um, the often kind of banality and obscurity are taking over just kind of creating variations of Hollywood and memes and on the other hand having kind of artistic positions like uh, painters from Poland like Beszynski that was creating very specific paintings now are kind of a known keyword in these prompts and I feel that the, the whole idea of art is kind of turned upside down because the democratization on the one hand, on the other hand, um, these companies that have no real interest in art history and art are kind of just pushing out tools and we are kind of stuck between the obscurity and kind of the influence of different um, cultural spheres and because it's so overwhelming, also the um, contemporary art world is adapting this visual language and uh, tries to kind of appropriate it. And this is something I found quite surprising. And to, to end my talk, um, I really hope that this full access to human creativity makes it possible in the end, or on the way, uh, to find alternative histories, to find hybrids, to revision certain cultural terms, because there's no way back, I think. The, the impact on the visual is unstoppable in all the other fields as well. And um, yeah, I really hope that there will be a chance that we learn to differentiate more between the signal and the noise and kind of distribute our attention accordingly. And yeah, 
that's it. And I'm sorry that it's kind of a bus, but uh, maybe some questions can shape um, your impression of that. So please line up behind the microphones if you have questions for Robert. And also you can pose the questions via the internet and then the signal angel will read them out. Uh, microphone number two, please. Hi, um, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, it's really cool to see an artist <laughs> at this convention. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, um, I was just thinking during your talk that um, it's kind of like a conversation with AI in terms of like AI generated art between the artist and the, the tool or the machine. And I'm wondering if you feel like that conversation goes both ways sometimes, like you're inputting the prompts and you have a certain idea of what you want and then the AI generates what it thinks of those prompts and then of course there's reiterations. Um, do you ever feel inspired by what the AI produces, inspired even to the extent that you return to like drawing, like pencil, paper and paint to kind of imitate what you've seen generated? Um, it's, it's, the inspiration is there, it's, it's, the, for me, the, the film is made out of hundreds of versions of these sequences, and I, I found it kind of to be a relief that I could try something in that style, in that style, and try to see if I can match up things that would be not possible, just, um, in, um, in the sense of spending time with something. But, but I know I'm in a kind of wonderful position to choose and to look and see around, but, but I know that for everyone else this will be kind of hell because you have to optimize and to find the best thing in short time. And um, I haven't been trying to draw these things, but, but I'm... I found it really interesting in confronting it with uh, projections and the physical space to see how these things um, can be adapted to physical momentum. But I haven't been kind of finding a good um, yeah, opportunity to, sh to really show it. It's also because of Corona, a lot of things just disappeared, festivals disappeared, exhibition spaces, and it's, um, yeah, it, it, the next years definitely will be interesting. <laughs> we hope so, right? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Now we have a question Thanks. from microphone number one. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the talk. Very inspiring, very interesting. Didn't know this was, this was possible using AI. Um, question regarding the training data behind the models you used. Uh, are you bothered with the question of consent, so that artists said, yes, you can use my, my art as a training input, and does it bother you if your art is used for as training data? Um, that's a very broad question, and that's why I was using the WikiArts data set, because it's kind of all trained on, on images that are out of copyright uh, requirements. And I, I also have been specifically using it because I wanted to see what's possible in there. And of course, using something like Clip on top of it, you don't really know what, uh, you know that there's very unethical data in there. And, and I, I have friends that try to kind of um, train their own models. And I also try to train or I try to train my own models these days. It's been much harder back then. So there's a lot of things happening and especially with kind of tool chains like using Comfy UI, there are things where you can use a single image not only as a style transfer but also as a kind of your own filtering system. So. I think it ties into the point that you made about uh, public 
uh, software, so open source, yeah, yeah. giving uh, the tools, yeah, and also the training data, of course. Yeah. But sorry, no, don't want to take too much time. No, for no, the no. Next question. Uh, yeah, no, no. I just just want to say about kind of um, if I feel kind of things are taken from me because this is mm -hmm. something that is sometimes left out of this dialogue. Um, I feel yes, there's not much of my work in these data sets, but Yet. I've <laughs> <laughs> but I feel um, no nobody ever has cared for artists, and I mean there are kind of things like Vg uh, Bildkunst and these things that try to create something, but but it has never been a discussion, and it wouldn't be if it would be just about artists. I mean, this uh, today the New York Times was suing OpenAI and Microsoft. So I think copyright only works above a certain threshold of, of importance. And that's something you learn while being in this, that your voice doesn't matter for the whole. So it's also a bit Thank you. humbling. And I think we have a question from the internet. And then it looks like we have three more questions in the room. Yeah, question from the internet. Um, are you aware of Peter Gabriel's Panopticon? It seems uh, that a very, very similar visual style was used and maybe the tools were similar too. Um, I mean, if it's the kind of competition of Peter Gabriel for the music videos, um, which was run by Stable Diffusion, I think, um, Yes, and these diets I was using in this specific example are nothing new because I try to navigate art history. And um, because there are certain styles that are very kind of interesting to the eye, maybe phrase it as this mid-journey style, they have a um, strong impact on that. And I. I'm not sure if, if we can escape this kind of standardized look because um, it's so effective in a sense. And with my newer work, I tried to step away from that, but it was just kind of an exploration ground and um, yeah. Good, we have a question from microphone number two. Yes, hi. Um, as you mentioned, the pace of advancement is so fast that the technology is uh, getting rid of really fast as well. But there is uh, some special artifacts that's tied to uh, some stages of tech. Mm -hmm. And do you think there's lost artistic value with those tech fading uh, away in the distance, like nobody's using CNNs for image generation nowadays and stuff like that? Um, yes, I think, I mean, like um, Deep Dream and all these things had kind of their own style. Um, to be honest, mostly, or um, most of the things are just used for small tests, for like some Instagram video or some meme. And I try to work, I mean, it's not a big work, but it's a four minute movie. And I feel that a lot of these things are not used to create something that is more than just kind of this sketchy th sketch. Mm. Um, and with new tools like Runway and Pika Labs, this will shift. But, but I think these things will be emulated, simulated at a certain point, like VHS tapes or tape machines and music. But um, with these emulations, I don't know how precise they will be, because the human eye is focused on specific things. And um, yeah, I don't know if if we will be aware enough to see these small uh, details that, that come with it. But it's an interesting question to think about. We have two more questions left. We have about one minute. So microphone number one and then microphone number two, really short and short answer. Maybe a bit continuation on the question you just asked about iterations on tools. It's a pretty modern art concept to sort of play with the same tool and understand the craftsmanship of it. What do you feel about yourself as an artist within this change of tour that you don't really have control and then it iterates again and again? And then microphone number two. Well, can I uh, answer first? Or? Oh, well, I was thinking if, we, if you wanted to answer both of the questions. No. Then, okay, <laughs> then we do question number two. <laughs> Um, 
I mean, this concept of craftsmanship is something that I tried to kind of develop for 20 years, using kind of the same tools, trying to grow and understand, and now it's like things are thrown at you, and you have to learn not to catch, try to catch everything. And for my work in that point, I was not looking at Reddit and Discord anymore, but worked for like four months on this specific thing without taking input, or far less input than usual. And um, it's a good question overall if, if this kind of acceleration will kind of take away all of our attention span and skills because the AI is kind of replacing this. And I'm, I'm worried and I have a hard time adapting, but I'm quite sure and I discussed this with a friend in the morning, that a younger generation doesn't know, per se, what, what it's been like being a master, working with the software for several years, because it's there. And there might be people going back, but I don't know. It will, will be interesting how they navigate this freedom. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Robert. And please give Robert a round of applause. Ah.